You're about to hear a Sherlock Holmes adventure, adapted by Edith Miser from the famous novel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, entitled The Hound of the Baskervilles. Beginning tonight, and each of the following five evenings, we will bring you an installment of this thrilling mystery. Before we join the genial Dr. Watson and start tonight's tale, all of us here at CHS Studios would like to wish you a most safe and spooky Halloween night. Are you tired of having the same old lunch every day? Is dry white bread losing its spice for you? Are your common houseplants looking sad as of late? Well, do we have just the product for you? Heymans has been creating high-quality, suspiciously good mayonnaise for their family for generations, and it's about time they spread that love to you. At 12 o'clock shop, I start the latter half of my day off right with a dollop of Heymans suspiciously good mayonnaise. I use it on my fries, burgers, and everything in between. It's a surefire way to put more zest into any meal. Not only is it good on grilled cheese, but did you know it's good for your hair, for buffing out those pesky scuff marks, and for turning any dusty common houseplant into a clean, polished, hey man, suspiciously good houseplant. That is why I keep a jar of hey man, suspiciously good mayonnaise in every room of my house, from the bathroom to the closet. In fact, as a special treat, I keep a jar of hey man, suspiciously good mayonnaise right next to me at all times. Hey man, suspiciously good mayonnaise. It's suspiciously good. So here we are in Dr. Watson's comfortable study. It's a bad night. The wind howls around the house like a lost soul. Just the night to begin the first installment of The Hound of the Baskervilles, huh, Mr. Bell? I hope you're not feeling jumpy, because I promise you it's a hair razor. Well, I suppose it's all right. That wind, you know, sort of eerie, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Oh, while you're still standing, would you mind turning out that light? T turn out that light? Yes, ghost stories should always be told in the dark. And the Hound of the Baskervilles is something of a ghost story, you know. Yes, but, but, look here. Oh, we'll still have the light of the fire, you know. Very well. If you say so, Dr. Watson. That's better. And I'd like to suggest that our listeners turn out their lights, too. I think this is a story that should be heard in the dark. Now then, Mr. Bell, are you ready? Yes, Dr. Watson. Sure you wouldn't like to look behind the chairs and under the table before we start? Certainly not. Confound that wind! Well, strangely enough, Mr. Bell, the story started out very calmly. Thank goodness for that. Yes. It was a cheerful spring morning. The sun poured into our rooms in Baker Street. Holmes, who was usually very late in the morning, except on the occasions when he'd been up all night, was seated at the breakfast table with his back towards me. I was standing by the window, examining a walking stick which had been left behind by a client who had called the previous night. Well, Holmes and I were out attending a recital of that delightful singer, Lily Leeman. Well, Watson, what do you make of it? Ha, huh, Holmes? How did you know I was examining this stick? You've had your back turned the entire time I've been looking at it. Sometimes I'm almost convinced you have eyes in the back of your head. Perhaps I have, Watson, but I really don't need them when there's a well-polished, silver-plated coffee pot sitting directly in front of me. Of course. I didn't think of that. Obviously. Well, about the stick. What did you deduce from that walking stick? Very well. To begin with, the owner's name is James Mortimer. Dr. James Mortimer, to be exact. The silver band just under the head is engraved with the inscription to James Mortimer M.R.C.S. from his friends of the C.C.H. 
and it's dated 1884. Remarkable. Well, go on. All right, give me time, can't you? I should say, Dr. Mortimer is a successful elderly medical man. Well esteemed. Good. Anything else? I should say he's a country practitioner and does a good deal of his visiting on foot. The stick has been rather thoroughly knocked about, and the iron for rule is quite badly worn. Perfectly sound. Of course it's perfectly sound. Furthermore, friends of the CCH should mean friends of the something something hunt. Probably the local hunt to whose members he has given some surgical assistance at one time or another. Really, Watson, you excel yourself. Elementary, my dear Holmes, elementary. Oh, come now, Watson. Mustn't underrate your own abilities. You may not be particularly luminous yourself, but you are a first-class conductor of light. What do you mean by that? Simply that some people, without possessing genius themselves, have a remarkable power of stimulating it in others. <laughs> I am greatly indebted to you, my dear Watson. Conceit. Yes. Let me see that stick. Very well. Here it is. Hmm. Have I overlooked something? Overlooked? No, Watson. Most of your deductions were erroneous. No, look here, Holmes. Not that you were entirely wrong. By no means. The man is undoubtedly a country practitioner. Well, then? On the other hand, I would suggest, for example, that a presentation to a doctor is more likely to come from a hospital than from a hunt, and that the initials CC before hospital very naturally suggest the words Charing Cross. Yes, I... Yes, you may be right. Quite possibly, all of which leads us to the conclusion that the man practised in town before going to the country. Uh, yes, that would be possible. Quite. And he wasn't on staff of the hospital. Why not? Because only a man well established in a London practice can hold such a position, and such a man isn't going to drift into the country. Very well. Then what was his connection with the hospital? Probably house surgeon or house physician. But that's little more than a senior student. Quite a young man. Obviously. And since he left barely five years ago, the date on the stick tells us that, he is still a young man. And thirty. Then my... my grave middle-aged family practitioner vanishes into thin air. And in his place emerges a young fellow. Amiable, unambitious, absent-minded, and the possessor of a favourite dog. A dog larger than a terrier and smaller than a mastiff. Now, Holmes, you're just showing off. Not at all, my dear Watson. Only an amiable man has presentations made to him. Only an unambitious man takes to a country practice, particularly with such a good record as this fellow has. And only an absent-minded one leaves his favourite walking stick behind. But the dog? What about the dog? See here, in the middle of the stick? Tooth marks? The dog has been in the habit of carrying the stick about. The marks are well defined. The jaw, I should say. Yes, by Jove, it is a curly-haired spaniel. Now, Holmes, really, you can't possibly be sure of that. On the contrary, my dear Watson, he's just mounting our steps, accompanied by his master. Yes, tall man, thin nose, keen grey eyes sparkling behind eyeglasses. Rather slovenly clad, general air of benevolence. Wait, there's his step on the stair. A new adventure is walking into our lives. What does Dr. James Mortimer, the man of science, ask of Sherlock Holmes, the specialist in crime? Probably wants you to subscribe to something. No, I have a feeling, a premonition, something more. Come in, come in. Ah, oh, my stick. So I did leave it here. A presentation, I see. Yes. Down, Carlos. You can't have it now. From the Charing Cross Hospital. On the occasion of my marriage, yes. When I married, I left the hospital. Had to make a home for my own. Took a country practice. Not so far off, Watson. <laughs> and now, Dr. James Mortimer. Mr. Just Mr. 
A humble MRCS. But a man of precise mind. A dabbler in science. I, I presume it is Sherlock Holmes whom I am addressing. Quite so. And this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Glad to meet you, sir. Delighted. Yes. You interest me very much, Mr. Holmes. I had hardly expected so dulciophallic a skull, or such a well-marked supraorbital development. Would you have any objection to me running my finger along your parietal fissure? Not at all. Interesting. Very interesting. A cast of your skull, Mr. Holmes, until the original is available, would be an ornament to any anthropological collection. I, I must confess, I, I covet your skull, sir. Dear me, Holmes, I had no idea you possessed such a museum piece. <laughs> You're as much of an enthusiast in your line, Mr. Mortimer, as I am in mine. Down, Carlos. Hope you don't object to dogs. Yes, that skull is remarkable. Remarkable. Come now, Mr. Mortimer. You didn't come here merely to examine my skull. Uh, no, of course not. As a matter of fact... I came to you, Mr. Holmes, because I am suddenly confronted with a most serious and extraordinary problem. Indeed. And what is that? Finding the solution, or perhaps I should say, explanation of the sudden death of Sir Charles Baskerville. You suspect he was murdered? Well, no. I can't honestly say I do. The death was undoubtedly due to heart failure. Sir Charles' heart was weak. In fact, I, as his physician and friend had advised him going to London to have it examined. He was on the eve of doing so when death overtook him. When did he die? He died, Mr. Holmes. He died night before last, as he was taking an after-dinner walk. He had gone as far as the gate, the gate that leads out into the moor. Hmm. Sir Charles Baskerville. He was a bachelor, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Mr. Holmes. A splendid, generous man with the interest of his community at heart. His death is a great loss to us all. I seem to remember reading that before he came into the title, he had gone out to South Africa and amassed a large fortune. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Quite so. And this fortune, it is still fairly large, I take it. Who inherits it? And the title? It goes to a man by the name of Henry Baskerville. He is the son of Sir Charles' younger brother. The young man lives in America, I believe. Quite a nice little plum to fall into anyone's lap, huh, Holmes? A title and a fortune all at once. Lucky chap. I'm not so sure, Dr. Watson. Oh? Any drawbacks? Well, I, I don't know. That's why I want Mr. Holmes to look into the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. It, it may be foolish superstition, but if it isn't, it's only fair to warn the new heir. What are you talking about? The curse of the Baskervilles. A curse, eh? Sounds rather romantic. Look here, Mr. Mortimer, you don't actually believe there's such thing as a curse? Well, no. That is, I didn't until... until I saw what happened to my friend, Sir Charles Baskerville. I see. And just... just what is this curse that has settled itself on the house of the Baskervilles? It's a very ancient one, Mr. Holmes. Here, I... I have a manuscript in my pocket. So I notice, Mr. Mortimer. It's quite old. Early 18th century, I should say, from the bit of it I can see sticking out of your pocket. The exact date is 1742. This paper was committed to my care by Sir Charles Baskerville before his death. He, he had a presentiment, perhaps I should say conviction, that something was going to happen to him. He took this document very seriously. He was prepared for just such an end as did eventually overtake him. Hmm. Interesting. And the contents of this manuscript? It is a statement of a legend which runs in the Baskerville family. It seems that a certain Hugo Baskerville, who was wild and unprincipled young man, is supposed to have sold his soul to the devil. Hmm. Interesting. But better read us the manuscript, Mr. Mortimer. Very well. I believe I can decipher the old-fashioned script. The heading is Baskerville Hall, and is dated 1742. It begins, Of the origin of the Hound of the Baskervilles there have been many statements. But as I come in a direct line from Hugo Baskerville, on whom the curse first rested, and as I have the story from my father, who had it from his, I do hereby set it down, with all belief that it occurred even as is here recorded. The old boy certainly writes with conviction, huh, Holmes? Watson, don't interrupt! Go on, Mr. Mortimer. 
I would have my sons believe that the same justice which punishes sin may also graciously forgive it, and that no bane is so heavy but by the prayer, repentance, and honest living it may finally be removed. Know then that at the time of the Great Rebellion this manor of Baskerville was held by Hugo of the same name, nor can it be gainsaid that he was a most wild, profane, and godless man. Moreover, there was a certain wanton and cruel humour which made his name a byword through the countryside. Now it chanced that Hugo's covetous eyes came to rest on the daughter of a certain yeoman who had held lands near the Baskerville estate, but the young maiden, being of discreet and good repute, would ever avoid his advances. So it came to pass that one Michaelmas, this Hugo, with some five or six of his idle and wicked companions, stole down upon the farm and carried off the maiden, her father and brothers being gone from home, as well they knew. When they had brought her to the hall, the maiden was placed in an upper chamber, while Hugo and his friends sat down for a long carouse, as was their nightly custom. Wassail, my good, my lusty fellows, wassail. Wassail. Hugo. Wassail. <laughs> Fill your tankards. By St. Hubert, I have a great thirst. Otto, Otto, where is the varlet? Here I be, master. Bring in another cake. Aye, master. Let it be a burgundy. Aye. Burgundy. <laughs> Good red burgundy. Now I cannot abide your pale Rhenish wines. Right, Hugo. Pale wines. Like pale women. There's no blood to them. No spirit. No fire. Give me the French. French wines and French women, eh, Cedric? You're wrong, Alfred. It is the English wenches are the best. Pink cheeks, straight limbs. No, I'll have none of your bandy-legged foreigners. They're too easy to get. Why, who wants to chase a sick fox, eh? Give me English girls and English hunting. There's no better sport to be had the world over. Hark to him. He's had his sport today. It was good hunting, eh, Hugo? Good hunting. Now, by the rude, as it was, never better. Now, we bagged a dove, eh? A little white dove. A wild dove, I call her, Hugo. Aye, wild. She kicked and scratched a bit. Give me the wild one. The wild ones! The wild ones! A toast to the wild ones! A toast to the little white dove! A toast to the bridegroom! <laughs> <laughs> ah, bridegrooms. <laughs> the lucky wench. Little spitfire. One more drink, and I'll go up and tame her. Now, now where's Otto and that keg of wine? Now, where's Otto, I say? I be coming, master. The keg is heavy. But well, make haste, or I'll slit your belly. Wouldn't have your master die of thirst? Now make haste, you fool. You're at me, master. I'll have the bung out afore you can wink an eye. The bung? Now, you great idiot, we've got no time for that. Now break in the cask, break it in. Oh, master, I fear I'm not strong enough for that. <laughs> not strong enough, oh, you whimpering old fool. It takes no great strength to burst open a keg of wine. Here. Let me at it. There, how's that? The wine, the red wine, how it gushes out. Lap it up, lap it up. But master, it runs out on the floor. The good red wine, tis a sinful waste. Listen to the fellow. Sinful, is it? Now, what do you know of sin, you toothless old death's head? Now, get out, you spoil our feast. But master... Now get out, I say, before I plant my boot where it belongs. <laughs> I master, I go, I go. Heaven have mercy on us. What will become of the house of Baskerville if a stop be not put to this wickedness? <laughs> Listen to them in there carousing and a swilling. Tis a wicked waste. And half the countryside dying of famine. Surely the good Lord must be blind if he do not put a stop to it. And the poor child locked in that room upstairs. I'd best go to her. It might be I can give her a word of comfort. Aye, 
the wickedness that has come into this house. The only mercy is the old master is not alive to see it. Miss Lucy? Miss Lucy, are, are you all right? Who's there? Be not afeard, child. It's only Otto. Old Otto, here at the keyhole. Otto, Otto, let me out, for the love of heaven. That I cannot, for the door is locked, and the master has the key. Oh, what can I do? You must help me. Get me a knife, Otto. Slide it under the door. A knife? What would you be doing with a knife, child? I, I'd rather be dead than alive and locked up in Hugo Baskerville's house. You must not say such things. It's no right. Besides, I could not slip your knife if I would. There's no room between the door and the sill. But what am I to do? What am I to do? There's one thing you could do, child, if you have the courage. I have the courage for anything. The window is not locked. No, the window is open, but it's so far from the ground. If I jump, I'll be killed. Yes, that's a way out. I'll do that if he comes near me. No, there's a better way, if you're strong enough. The ivy. Crawl down the ivy. It's very old. Maybe it'll hold you. I'll try. Even if it breaks, it can't be any worse than than the other. Thank you, Otto. There goes the bridegroom. <laughs> Good luck, Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> Quick. He's coming. Oh, I'll show you how to tame a wild dog. I'll show you. The signs protect her. The signs. Otto, is, is that you? Aye, master. That was still hanging about, eh? I was just going up to my bed. Well, be gone then. Now I'll not be needing you this night. <laughs> no, not tonight. Now to see how my little bird is faring. I. Here's the key. Confound that lock. I must have jumped about like a grasshopper. Ah, that's better. Now then, my pretty, my sweet. Your great bear has come a-calling. You've been waiting for me, eh? Hmm. No answer. <laughs> oh, the wench is hiding. What sport? Oh, I'll find you, my angel. Eh. Not behind the door. Not under the bed. Now confound the girl. What's this? The window's open. You don't suppose she... No, no, there's nobody in the courtyard below. But the ivy, the ivy's all torn. By thunder! She's crawled down the ivy! She's gone! She's got away! Oh, no, she hasn't. Oh, by heaven! No, oh, they'll catch her! Cedric! Alfred! Hubert! All of you! Hello? What's up? She's not here! She's gone! <laughs> the bird has flown! Poor Hugo! <laughs> no, by Jupiter, I'll have her yet! I swear I'll have her! The devil may take my soul! If he'll but give me the girl. That's but a poor bargain. For the devil. <laughs> Come, we're wasting time. To horse. What are you going to do? Oh, we'll go a hunting. A real hunt. With the girl for the quarry. Cedric, use the hounds. Aye, that's sport for you. By God, I'll have her. If I have to scour the moors, I'll have her yet. <laughs> Here, Julie, here, here, Rex, smell this, it's a kerchief. Good boy. Fleet, get the scent. That's it, the hunt begins. Royce, the chase is on. Cedric, Cedric, we should have caught up to Hugo by now. He was riding hard, Alfred. Hard and fast. Like a bat out of hell. But he must needs have gone this way if he was following the girl. Aye, then. Why don't we hear the dogs? Answer me that. Cedric, there's something queer about the moor tonight. It turns my skin cold all down my spine. And the moon. 
pale and bloodless with that great ring around it. Tis no night for a sane man to be abroad. Shall we turn the horse's head? Cedric! What's that? Something black cowering against yon rock. Why, it's... it's old Eric, the shepherd. Hello there! Have you seen aught of the hunt? I... I... Uh... Why, the man's half dead with fright. He shakes as if he'd had the palsy. Speak up, you dolt. Have you seen the girl, Lucy, with the hounds hard after her? I... I... I have seen her. Good. But I have seen more. And what may that be? I have seen Hugo Baskerville. He passed on his black mare, and there are mute beside him such a hound of hell as God forbid should ever be at my heels. The man's raving! Come along, Alfred. Whip up your horse. We'll overtake him. Cedric, I'm afraid. That dog? There's nothing like that in the kennels at Baskerville. Come along, you fool. Would you be frightened by the tale of a peasant? Like an old woman. Very well. You go ahead, I'll follow. It's the moor that has gotten into your blood. Brace yourself. Hello? What's that streaking towards us? It's Hugo's mare. She's bolted. Look at her. She's frothing at the mouth. And the rain's dragging. What's happened to Hugo? Where is he? Whip up your horse. Whip it up! Something's amiss with Hugo. Cedric! Cedric, did you hear that? No mortal hound has ever let loose such a noise. It's the echo on the moors that makes it sound so eerie. Come along. Look, Cedric, there in the hollow. Hugo's dogs all cowering together as if they'd seen a ghost. The hound again! He's up ahead, beyond those two great rocks. We must find him. In heaven's name, go not near those stones. They say they were once a heathen temple. A temple where the devil was worshipped. That sound, it chills my blood. Turn back, Cedric, let us turn back. No, we must find Hugo. He may be hurt. Go back if you must. I'll go on alone. No, I'm coming too. Good. But now, we best go quietly around the stones. In case of any... Cedric. Cedric, there's the girl. Lying in the shadow of the nearest stone. She's dead. Aye. But what's that dark shape on the hill beyond? Form crouching black against the moon. It is standing over a body. It's Hugo's body. Great heaven! It's a beast! A great foul black beast! It's a hound, I tell you. A hound as big as a calf. He's tearing at Hugo's throat. And his eyes, they're blazing. Blazing with fire. Run, Alfred! Run for your life! It's the hound of the devil himself! Such is the tale, my sons, of the coming of the hound, which is said to have plagued our family so sorely ever since. Nor can it be denied that many of our family have been unhappy in their deaths, which have been sudden, bloody, and mysterious. Well, Mr. Holmes, what do you think of that? Very interesting, to a collector of fairy tales. Yes, that's what I would have said a week ago. But now, well, I'm not so sure. And what has shaken your conviction? The report at the inquest said that Sir Charles' body was found at the moorgate, face down, arms out, his fingers dug into the ground. There was no physical injury of any kind, and no marks of any footprints but his own, in the soft gravel of the walk. No traces to show that anyone else had been near the place. Well? They neglected to search the moor. I did not. A little way off I found... Footprints? Yes. Footprints. A man's or woman's? Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a hound. A gigantic hound. And that, Mr. Bell, is how we first heard of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Rather weird, wasn't it? Yes, very weird. (laughs) I'm glad I'm not out on any dark moor on Halloween. Do you mind if I turn on the lights? Not at all, Mr. Bell, not at all. (sighs) Ah, That's better. And now, Dr. Watson, won't you give us a hint at tomorrow's installment of The Hound of the Baskervilles? 
Well, I'll introduce you to the new heir to the Baskerville fortune, and I'll tell you about some of the mysterious complications that developed in London before we even started for Baskerville Hall. You have been listening to A Sherlock Holmes Adventure, adapted by Edith Miser. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider donating to the Chaska High School Theatre Department to help fund future projects. You can mail your donations to Chaska High School, care of Mrs. Jane Herget, 545 Pioneer Trail, Chaska, Minnesota, 55318. Tune in tomorrow at this same station at 7 p.m. St. Paul time for the next installment in The Hound of the Baskervilles. This program comes to you from the CHS studios in Minnesota.
Mr. Pop. Mr. Pop. <laughs> Mr. Pop. <laughs> Mr. Pop. <laughs> Mr. Pop. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mr. Pop. Eat. Mr. Pop. <laughs> Eat. 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 Eat